Hello, everyone, and welcome to another event by ESS. Today with us, we have Tiffany Reardon. Tiffany Reardon is one of our esteemed colleagues here at ESS and has been doing this work with students for many years. Uh, today, she's going to be giving you all a workshop on how to get involved in research. Now, I'll pass it off to Tiffany. Tiffany, welcome. Thank you so much, Luis. Um, welcome. Welcome, everyone. I know we're doing this in a webinar format, so um, I'd like to try and make it as interactive as possible. Um, we have the chat feature and Q&A. Um, so um, if you have any questions at all um, during the um, during the, the webinar, you can um, put it in the Q&A. If you put it in the Q&A, it's better uh, than the chat. So then um, Luis will read the questions and then we'll answer those questions. So any questions that you have at all, um, please feel free to um, type those in the Q&A. Um, and we will get started. Um, let's see who we have on here. We have, oh. We have a question already. Where can we find the recording of this meeting? I have a class starting soon, so I can't watch the whole thing. Not a problem at all. We will be um, broadcasting this uh, via our YouTube channel. So we will have it on YouTube. So you can watch it later um, if you like. Um, so not a problem at all. So we have about 16 folks on here. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and again, um, my colleague Luis will um, be reading the questions as they come up. Um, because I'm going to switch to um, presentation mode. So welcome to uh, getting involved in research. Um, this is probably one of my favorite presentations to do because I really love getting students um, involved in research. And um, after this talk, hopefully this will inspire you to get involved in research um, and really kind of give you some directions on um, re resources that are available to you all. So um, ordinarily in a smaller group setting, um, I will ask folks to kind of um, write down where they are. Um, I realize that we are in a webinar format, but I would still love to see um, who's on here. So if you don't mind, um, just in the, in the chat um, or in the chat to everyone or in the Q&A, um, where are you from? So are you from Northern California? Are you from Central Valley, SoCal? Canada, Europe, Arizona, very nice. SoCal, New York, ooh, very nice, New York. NorCal, where at in New York? I'm a, I'm a huge fan of New York. Um, so no, NorCal, um, Long Island, okay, very nice, very nice. Long Island is always fun. SoCal, very good, all right. Um, nobody from another continent. Um, so, but that's okay. Uh, if you, oh, Hong Kong, okay. Uh, very nice, Justin. Justin's from Hong Kong. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. I know there's quite a time difference. Very cool, SoCal, very good. All right, so um, no one from Antarctica in any of these um, events, but you know, you never know. So I always include that on there. So who am I? So my name is Tiffany Reardon and I work with Luis in the Center for Access to Engineering Excellence. And we talk a lot about this center, um, but when we get back on campus, it really is a center. It's actually a physical space where you can go, where you can get tutoring. Um, we have a lot of different workshops. Um, in, a, in a normal setting, this particular workshop would be um, in person, but now we're doing these online. But when we do get back on campus, um, it's a physical space that you can go. We have tutoring, we have snacks. Luis runs the center. Um, he's always looking for tutors. Um, in addition, we have a virtual center. And so for the time being, it is a virtual space. The CAEE, again, we call it the center. And that's a place uh, that you can utilize uh, virtually. You can utilize the remote tutoring, study groups, um, and of course, these workshops. So we hope you take advantage of those. Aside from um, working in the CAEE, I also run the PrEP and T-PrEP program. Um, we, do we have any PrEP or T-PrEP folks on here? Um, these are programs for incoming uh, freshmen and incoming transfer students. So, research. Will you enjoy research? Well, that really depends. 
If you enjoy hands-on work, and most engineers do, uh, cross-cultural teamwork, questioning everything. If you're one of those people who's like always, you know, questioning things, well, why is this? Why is that, right? If your mind just naturally thinks that way, um, and if you enjoy creating new knowledge, creating new knowledge is a cornerstone of Berkeley engineering. And a lot of engineers that I have met um, really, you know, like to create new things, um, whether that be uh, designing things or working on side projects or just really um, kind of wondering how things work, then uh, research might be for you. I always say that coming to a school like Berkeley and not at least trying research is kind of like going to San Francisco and not seeing a cable car, right? It's something you should do. It's something you should try to do. And you know, maybe you'll like it, right? But definitely try it. And today we're going to point you into the direction where you can actually um, get resources and you can get involved in research, paid research. Paid is always good. Um, so acronyms, we love our acronyms in the research world. Once you decide that you're going to pursue research, um, these are some acronyms that you will likely encounter. And so I've made a, a short list. There's many, many others, but these are just kind of the most uh, common ones you'll see. First is the NSF. Anyone want to try and take a guess what the NSF stands for? You can just go ahead and chat your uh, response, NSF. We also have REU, National Science Foundation. Good job, Rishi and Ellen, good for you. National Science Foundation. What about REU? I'll give you a hint. The uh, U stands for undergrads, undergraduate, yes, but REU, REU. That's something that you, uh, hopefully next summer you'll be in an REU. That stands for Research Experience for Undergrads. And we're gonna talk a bit about REUs. DOE is another one. Uh, DOE actually, um, you probably have heard that maybe in a, in a number of ways. Good, very nice, Reese. Uh, Department of Energy, right? Um, you probably saw that when you were in, in high school, the Department of Education, but um, in the research world, it stands for Department of Energy. LBNL. Uh, LBNL stands for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, when we get on campus, it's very likely that you will um, you will hear uh, folks talking about the research that's being um, done up on the hill. Um, when they say the research on the hill, they're not talking about DC. They're actually talking about Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, LBNL. Europe is another one that you might hear. That's the Undergraduate Research Opportunities Program. And Europe, which is Undergraduate Research Apprenticeship Program. So those are two programs that um, are eligible and you are all eligible to apply for and participate in. And we had a question from Richard. Richard wanted to know if it will be recorded. Absolutely, we will record this. So finding research on campus. So um, across the campus, um, you as engineers have skills that are sought after, sought after uh, by folks everywhere. So uh, good ways to get started in your quest for finding research. One would be research.berkeley.edu. That is a great source. Um, you will find that folks from all across campus are looking for students like you and have a variety of research projects. In addition, you'll also find the specific programs such as the Europe program, um, the Haas Scholars program, the UCDC program. A uh, fun fact, if you are interested in that program, you can actually do research in DC. Um, I realize now it might be a little bit different um, because of the pandemic, but uh, in the future, that is an option. In addition, there's the Summer Undergraduate Research Fellowship Program, which you can apply for. All of these programs are either paid or for credits, and um, they are looking for students from all majors. So regardless of your major, your GPA, um, these are things that you can apply to. There's also the Fireball Scholars Program. This is a program that's paid research um, that you can apply for. This program um, is specifically, um, will fund students that are undocumented students, DACA students, um, formerly incarcerated students, um, a variety of other populations. And it is um, 
a program where you come up with a research project, so there is some flexibility in that. Some of these programs already have predetermined projects. In this program, you can either come up with a project or there are um, projects that you can join. Aside from that, there are a ton of research centers across campus. So there is no shortage of research and there are opportunities for all. So this list alone um, is, is pretty good if you are hoping to do research on campus. Now I realize when I say on campus, that sounds kind of weird, right? You're like, what is she talking about? I'm in my dorm, I'm in my living room. What does she mean on campus? What I mean is the research project is hosted by the campus. Now when we get back on um, campus, when we get back on campus, then it'll really feel like, okay, you know, okay, I get what she's talking about. But um, I will tell you that there are some students that are doing research on campus. And so it depends on the lab. I know Lawrence Berkeley Lab and I know some labs uh, in the College of Engineering are open. So it really depends. We have a question um, and this is a great question. I'm really happy you asked this question. Can international students participate in research if so, is it sponsored? Yes and yes, absolutely. Yes, you can get paid research and yes, it can be sponsored. We're gonna talk a little bit um, about the mechanics of that, but if you're thinking, oh, you know, I, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get sponsored research, not true, you can. Okay, so we went over the campus resources. Let's talk a little bit about college resources. So. One resource uh, is Beehive, beehive.berkeley.edu. That's a great one because in the Beehive, um, this is a site where you can actually go in, you type it in, it's only for Berkeley students, and it will show you a uh, database of research projects. The cool thing about it is you can sort by paid versus unpaid. You can sort by uh, folks uh, that are looking for people that want positions for units. You can look, you know, maybe they want somebody who knows MATLAB or Python, and you can, you know, click on that and then see the projects. You will need a resume. So that's a great thing about Beehive is you'll need a resume. And um, generally, it, it literally goes into the um, box of the student who, um, the grad student, typically it's a grad student, although sometimes it will go directly to the faculty member and you just apply. It's very, very easy. Um, and you'll see that they have a lot of um, projects on there. Now, if you're thinking about summer research, a, um, a thing about Beehive that I've noticed is that for summer, they generally will likely um, post summer positions in May. I know that seems kind of late, but May. But you might apply for a position through Beehive and you might actually extend your time through the summer, which I actually think would be um, a great experience. Aside from that, there's the ESS newsletter. I hope you're checking the newsletter every week because oftentimes we will post um, opportunities that we get and we'll put those in the ESS newsletter for you. Um, generally speaking, if it's you know not something that undergrads would be eligible for, so we're not gonna put it in there. So uh, these, are, these are usually really good resources. Aside from that, your department. So, all of you, I'm assuming, are in the College of Engineering or are taking classes in the College of Engineering. Um, and so you can go to your individual department and you can look at research by major. So the example that I gave um, is mechanical engineering, just because mechanical engineering uh, is so, so broad. There's facets of mechanical engineering and many of our faculty have joint appointments in other departments. But if you go to your um, engineering department and you look at research, you can click on which faculty are doing research in which areas. And that'll kind of give you a sense of the projects that are out there. And I um, encourage you, if you decide to use Beehive, it also might be helpful um, if you see the faculty's name to maybe also kind of look and see what um, research they're doing. Aside from that, you can go on the individual links. Um, MSC, for example, they have uh, research on their site, EECS, of course, um, all the, the departments. Faculty office hours. Aside from um, you know, talking to faculty and learning from them and connecting with them, it's also um, 
completely acceptable and almost um, expected that visiting faculty at their office hours, um, virtual for now, but that's also a great way to get uh, research. I've, I've met many students that have talked with faculty and simply asked, do you, are you hiring undergrads? Do you have any research projects that um, you're looking for people? That's a great and easy way. One of the things you'll find is a lot of times students will say, well, I didn't know it was going to be this easy. And it really is easy. It's just a matter of putting yourself out there. When meeting a professor, even if it's online, um, you want to be prepared, right? You really want to be prepared. Um, you should have a resume. All of you should have a resume. There are some phenomenal resources available uh, through the Career Center on how to um, prepare your resume. Many, um, you know, on campus, I, I believe the center hosts some events on, on doing a, an acceptable resume. Um, but you want to put all the things on your resume that will show that you're a good candidate for the research position. First of all, you want to include relevant coursework. Coursework that you're taking now and coursework that you're taking in spring. Very important. So if you're taking the classes now, you put in progress. If you're taking the classes in spring, you put planned. Other skills that you want to highlight that will um, be skills that will be helpful for research, these are things like um, teamwork experience. Um, you know, these could be, if you're a first year student, for example, and you haven't done any research experience, it's totally fine. I'm sure you have tons of things that you put on your college applications. Maybe you're a transfer student. Maybe you did um, extracurricular activities or jobs. Maybe you were in the military. Maybe you have a lot of experience. You want to highlight those because those things will show that you have an aptitude for research and those are skills that likely your professors will want to see. You need to familiarize yourself with your professor's research projects. You can do that easily by going to their web pages, maybe skimming some of their journals. But the last thing you want to do is say, um, oh yeah, I'd like to work in your lab. What do you do, right? It's kind of like when you apply for a job. You won't, um, you won't go for a, an info session at Boeing and say, what do you guys do again, right? Speaking of Boeing, there actually is an info session uh, this Thursday. They're coming and they are looking for folks. I know for a fact that they actually um, are looking for EECS folks. So if anyone um, is interested in working for Boeing and is EECS, they are very, very hungry for EECS students. So uh, shoot me an email and I, I will send you the information. That's this Thursday. Um, aside from that, um, be articulate. Be very articulate about um, the research that you're looking for and why, right? Maybe you've been working on a project. And fun fact, I actually had a student who um, in his spare time, this student is now uh, a PhD student at the University of Maryland College Park, who um, he was doing, uh, he had a, um, what is it called? He had a, um, uh, an arm, right? Um, he had an arm that he was working on, a robotic arm, and he just did it in his spare time. And he worked on this for years and years and years. And he started it when he was at community college and he continued working on it. Eventually, he went to Alice Agagino's lab. He did research, he enjoyed it. He said, hey, you know, I'd, I'd love to do this as a career. And now he's a PhD student. Aside from that, he's also um, loving it. And hopefully he'll come back to Berkeley and be a professor. That would be awesome. Um, but he came in and showed uh, his project that he was working on, and that really showed that he had the interest and aptitude. I can't stress that, that enough, the interest and aptitude. That's really important. So again, even if you've never, never, never done research, it's okay, um, interest and aptitude. And really um, you know, familiarize yourself with the research that's being done. So off campus. So maybe you are on campus now, right? Maybe you're on campus now and you are living in the dorms. Maybe you are, um, you know, you like Berkeley, but you're like, you know what, I don't know if I want to do research on campus. That's okay. Because the closest off camp op option, as we said, is LBNL. Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So LBNL, again, the Hill, 
um, that's where pretty much every single STEM major has research being conducted at LVNL. And so I've listed some of the divisions and they have departments at um, LVNL. If you have friends that are in high school, if you have friends that are community college, they also have uh, programs for students as well. They have the Suli program. That's a program where they bring students to um, the lab for 10 weeks in summer. They also have the Blur program, which is for Berkeley students. Um, they also have uh, spring um, opportunities as well. And so I, I know for a fact that for spring, they're actually recruiting right now for those programs. So if you want to do research uh, at LBNL in spring, you would apply right now. Now, here's the deal with LBNL. You have to be very, very specific about who you want to work with and what projects you want to work on. So you can't just send a you know, generic application and say, you know, I'll do anything. You have to talk about who you want to work with and when, in which lab. And so you have to go through and you have to look at the projects. Um, they have some phenomenal opportunities. I think the mentoring at the lab is exceptional. Um, many of our faculty, you might notice when you look at them, many of them have joint appointments with the lab. A lot of the uh, material science faculty tend to have joint appointments as well as the mechanical engineers. And so really, um, if it's a faculty member in your department, maybe it's someone who's not in your department, but you're really interested in their fields of research, I encourage you to check out uh, the opportunities at the lab. Here's a couple, um, and I listed these specifically because I've had students um, working in these uh, divisions at the lab. So the advanced light source, they've hired, um, I've had civil engineers that have done research in uh, material science. I've also had mechanical engineers that have done research there. Um, certainly the EECS and CS students might be interested in NERSC. That's a uh, big data supercomputing. If you're interested in that, they have a lot as well. The Agile uh, Biofoundry is another one as well. So I've had students in all of these labs and many of these students uh, are now in PhD programs. So these are, these are great experiences for students and I, I really, really um, like what the lab is doing and, and it's a really supportive environment. So if you wanna go off campus, but not too far, LBNL uh, is, a, is a good option. Um, so maybe you're like, you know what? Okay, so the Long Island student, the Long Island student, where specifically are you from in Long Island? I'm very curious if you're still, if you're still on here. Who's the Long Island student? I don't see him on there, him or her. Oh, Nassau County. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so maybe uh, Rishi, maybe Rishi's like, you know what? I think I kind of want to stay on the East Coast for the summer. I like Berkeley, but I don't know if I want to stay in Long Island. I don't know if I want to stay in Berkeley. I want to go somewhere else. So maybe Rishi says, you know what? I Tell me more about these uh, REU programs. I want to do an REU. So REU stands for Research Experience for Undergrads. So these are typically hosted by a university department or a center um, on a college campus. Generally speaking, these are funded by the National Science Foundation. And if they are funded by the National Science Foundation, um, if they are funded by uh, the NSF, typically they will uh, require that you be a US citizen or permanent resident. Now, you might be saying, whoa, Tiffany, you just told me I could. Okay, the funding source. Now, a lot of schools and a lot of programs have multiple funding sources. So maybe the project itself is funded by the National Science Foundation, but a lot of schools, and I've seen this a lot, particularly uh, the private schools, the Ivy League schools, they'll often have a separate pool of funding where they can bring on additional students. Additional students and they won't have those restrictions. So don't panic if you're like, oh great, that leaves me out. It doesn't leave you out at all. Um, so if if it says specifically that you have to be US citizen or permanent resident, then that's the case. But oftentimes they will distinguish on there that they have multiple funding sources. And so you can apply. In addition, some programs will also say 
you must be attending a U.S. institution. And guess what? All of you are, so you're good. Okay, so typically these programs bring in at about 10 students per, um, per program. They are funded. Um, they are depending on the program. They usually give probably between 4,000 and 8,000, depending. Housing is usually provided, certainly meals, they expect you to eat. Uh, and then travel is typically, uh, you know, if you have to fly there, depending on how far you live from the, um, the site. But those are typically paid for. These are amazing experiences because these can, these can tell you and give you a sense of whether or not you would enjoy this um, option and pursuing a research focused graduate degree or maybe a career in research. If you are doing an REU and you enjoy it, it also shows um, whether or not you would be qualified for that degree. We're gonna talk a little bit about that later. But these are, these are great. And I bet you if you talk to your grad students, you talk to some of your GSIs, you'll find that they probably did an REU at some point in their career. Maybe they don't know that it was called an REU, but they might say like, oh yeah, I was at Ohio State for 10 weeks in the summer when I was a sophomore. Guess what? That's an REU. Uh, two quick questions. I'm a senior and planning to apply for grad school. Can I apply for it? Yes. If they say on the application non-graduating seniors and you're graduating this uh, spring or fall, maybe not, but I have seen some that will take, um, that will take uh, seniors. The thing is that you just have to uh, just let them know. But yes, I have seen that. So if you're planning to um, you know, graduate in you know, spring, but then it's a summer one, you probably still can. I've seen them do it sometimes. And sometimes they'll actually take uh, first year master's students as well, even though it's, I know it's called REU, but depending on the site. Are REUs online for the time being? Good question. So last summer, because we had this unexpected pandemic, um, many programs, yes, many programs were online for the time being. But think about it, summer is quite a ways away. And I think that what's happening now is that um, programs are looking at, you know, option one, remote, option two, hybrid, and option three, 100% in person. So still apply, and they are still actively recruiting. So the benefits of an RU. So aside from interest in the major, and you know, preparing you for that major. Um, they also show qualities such as leadership and motivation. So you get to experience life as a researcher. Oh, fun fact. If you look at the Berkeley grad admissions page, I just saw this yesterday. If you look at the Berkeley grad admissions page, you will notice that participating in an NSF funded REU qualifies you for a graduate fee waiver. So probably more to it than that. I would suspect there is a lot more to it than that, but you should look into that. Um, it doesn't hurt. And I am telling you that if you've done an REU, and it's very smart on the part of grad division to do that, because if you've done an REU, they see, oh, wow, this is somebody who's, you know, probably has a lot of potential for graduate school, and we want to recruit them to Berkeley because we do take our own students for grad school at Berkeley. So that's a good thing. We like you, we want to keep you. So how to find an REU. So if you want to find an REU, um, there's three sources that I would recommend. I like this first one, the Pathways to Science. I like this one a lot because you can sort it by area Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe Ellen. So maybe Ellen, who's on here, maybe Ellen is an aerospace engineer. Ellen, what is your uh, major? I'm curious. Uh, maybe Ellen is an aerospace engineer and Ellen is a mechanical engineer and she wants to do aerospace. So she can sort it by aerospace. Maybe Justin um, is Eeks, but Justin is more on the hardware side, right? And so maybe Justin wants to do something in EE. So you can sort it by that. You can sort it by region. 
Um, it's a very nice and easy way to sort it. Um, it also has programs for high school students. So if you have any siblings or you have any cousins um, or younger people in your life um, that have an aptitude for, um, for research, then, then they can um, apply as well. So that's, that's a good one as well. Oh, I love this question. This is, I wish you would have put your name because I love this question. The question is, will REUs accept freshmen, especially those without prior research experience, or are they more suited for upperclassmen? Beautiful question. I'm going to answer that in a moment. Very good question. The question is, will they accept freshmen, especially those without prior research experience, or are they more suited for upperclassmen? All right, that is an, an amazing question. I'm going to answer that in just a minute. I think you're going to like my, uh, my answer. The second one is the NSF REU search. This isn't the most exciting one, to be honest. Basically, all it is, it's a, a list of schools and it shows the NSF funded them and they have an REU, right? It doesn't tell you what they're looking for. It doesn't answer the question that was just posed. It just says, hey, this school has an REU. And then you have to click on the REU and then you have to click and go and back and forth and you have to check and see what are the requirements, what are they looking for, blah, 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 right? But it does tell you, maybe for example, I'm gonna pick on Justin again. Maybe Justin got into Berkeley, but Justin also got into MIT. And he was like, you know, I always thought like, what would happen if I would have went to MIT? I'm gonna do an REU at MIT, do they have one? And so Justin goes and checks and says, yes, they do have an uh, RU at MIT, right? That's what that one tells you. So again, it's not the most exciting list and it is a lot of clicks, but it will tell you whether or not a school has an RU. Also, you can see uh, by research area, which is pretty cool, right? I don't know if we have any chemis on here, but if you're interested in chemistry, there are a lot of RUs for chemists. The third one, full disclosure, this is actually my blog. The third one I actually created specifically because I hate clicking around on REU sites, right? I work with students all the time. Students are asking, how do I get involved in research, blah, blah, blah. And so when I send announcements to students, I put everything out there. Here's the year they're looking for in school. Here is the uh, majors they're looking for. Here are the citizenship restrictions. Here's the deadline, right? I put that all in there and I give it to my students. I started doing that and then I started creating lists and then my colleagues at other schools annually would say, hey, are you gonna send that list out? Hey, are you gonna send that list out? And I said, you know what? Why don't I just make a blog? So I made a blog. So the REU Finder is a blog um, and I have by, and going back to the original question, the question was, what about students without research experience? Yes, absolutely. You can do an REU, and there are REUs specifically for students with no prior research experience. So yes, there also are some with students that have research experience. So they're looking for students from all over. Whether you are a first year student, whether you are a first year transfer student, whether you are a freshman, where you, whether you are an international student, it doesn't matter. There's something for you. And I have the pages categorized by that as well. So that was the answer. Oh, good question. Very good question. Is it okay to apply to multiple REUs at once and potentially have to decline offers if you get multiple? Yes and yes. You should apply to more than one. Absolutely, don't just apply to one. As I mentioned, they usually only take about 10 students. So, you know, the likelihood, I would say apply to five. Five is a really good number. And um, you also, if you do get, um, you know, multiple offers, you'll have to choose one, right? You, you can't do more than one. Um, but apply to more than one. And also, just much like a job offer, if you get accepted to an REU, you might tell the other REU that you haven't heard back from yet. You might say, hey, um, you know, I just found out that I was accepted into this REU, but I really want, you know, your REU at UC San Diego is my top pick. I was wondering, you know, when you know the deadline. 
And then the person will likely look at your application and say, oh, I want you. Even though the, the deadline has, you know, hasn't passed, I want to secure your slot and so you're in. So that happens sometimes. Okay, so I took a peek at the list of people that were registered early on. And so um, I see that we have some first year EEC students on here. So guess what? Whether you're EECS, whether you're CS intended, whether you're CS declared, doesn't matter. There is Carnegie Mellon, you might have heard of that school. They have a program specifically for first and second year students. And you can see neither research experience nor advanced computer science or software engineering experience is required. So you can apply to this program at Carnegie Mellon and they would love, love, love to have Berkeley students. They would love to have Berkeley students, right? So that's a good program. Also, remember, please indicate the classes you're taking now and the classes that you're taking in spring. Very important that you do that. John Topkins, I'm sure you've heard of John Topkins. They have a great program, Nanotechnology for Bio and Bioengineering Research for Undergrads. Great program as well. I've seen a lot of students do these programs at Johns Hopkins and later on go to grad school. So that's a good one. And I've heard really good things about Johns Hopkins. Maybe you're interested in autonomous vehicles. Guess what? University of Arizona has a great REU that you might be interested in. I had a student that did that program. Um, he's actually went to grad school. He did the MEng, um, and that was his first REU program. So that's a good one. Smart UAVs, that's another good one. I had a student two years ago who did that program. He was a CS student. He loved it. He it was a great experience, really enjoyed it. Northwestern uh, University Center for uh, Synthetic Biology, REU. Um, I know a lot of our uh, bioengineers are interested in synthetic biology, so that might be one. Civil engineers, did not forget about you all. There is, uh, UC San Diego has Designing for Safety and Safety by Design. That's one uh, that civil engineers might enjoy. This is just a small snippet. There are so many others, but I'm telling you, these, these programs want you. They want you to apply, and they are actively recruiting. Okay, so what does the application process look like? So they're going to want transcripts, right? So you're going to have to include your transcripts. Typically, they want two to three essays, short essays, but they want to get to know. They don't do interviews. So the essay really is like your interview. Um, and I'm gonna give you some uh, glimpse at the types of questions that they'll, answer, they'll ask for. They're gonna want letters of recommendation. So usually two letters of recommendation is a pretty standard. Um, fun fact, this picture right here, um, this picture is a picture of the poster session that we do. These aren't like stock photos, these are actually students. Uh, and when we get back on campus, we actually have a poster session that we do um, in October. This year, because of the pandemic, we're going to be doing it in November. So uh, check the ESS newsletter. We hope to see it. It'll be a virtual one. And then when we eventually get back on campus, we'll do the virtual one again. Um, but these students, uh, these, these are bioengineering students, and then these are civil engineering students. They're actual students that did research. Letters of recommendation. We're going to talk a bit about that because those are important. Uh, some terms that you'll encounter, rolling admissions. You're going to see that a lot. Rolling admissions. What does that mean? Rolling admissions means that they start, uh, you know, admitting students even before the deadline, right? So if they have a strong candidate, they know that you're applying to other programs. So if they they see you, they like you, they, they find a good mentor for you, um, they're gonna accept you, right? So rolling admissions, AKA apply early. You also will see rising sophomores. What is a rising sophomore? Uh, well, rising sophomore, if you're a freshman right now, when summer comes along, you're going to be a rising sophomore and so on and so forth, you get it? So rising sophomore. So right now, you would be applying for a program, you would be considered a rising sophomore. I know it's so confusing. I don't know why they don't just put first year, but whatever. But this is an important distinction because sometimes students will tell me, but Tiffany, I have, you know, I came in with a lot of AP units. I'm actually a, um, I'm not a, a sophomore. I'm actually a junior in Cal Central. 
That's not what they're talking about. They mean like the year, the year that you come in, right? So the year that you come in, first year, second year, third year, uh, that's what they're referring to. Non-graduating seniors. So a non-graduating senior is maybe you're graduating next December, not this December, but next December, you'd be considered a non-graduating senior. PI, that's another one that you're going to hear a lot. And sometimes when you start doing research on campus, you know, you'll be saying it too. My PI told me this, my PI said that. That stands for principal investigator. That's basically the lead on a research project. Okay, so the typical questions that you'll get. So a typical question that you'll get is something like, please explain why you wish to conduct some research of the type offered by the program. How does it relate to your overall interests and goals? Typically, they're going to want students that are interested in grad school, right? Have some interest in grad school because oftentimes they'll wanna recruit you for grad school at that institution or they, because it is funded by, you know, the NSF or DOE or whatever the funding source is, they're going to say, well, how many students actually went on to grad school, right? So if you are even a little teeny tiny bit remotely interested in graduate school, put that on your application, right? Because that's kind of what they're looking for. Now, how does it relate to your overall interests and goals? Um, tell them right tell them what you're interested in tell them why um you don't have to necessarily um you know come up with something brand new because i'm fairly certain that in your uc applications um you wrote something about your intended major and why you selected that major so i would simply go back to that revisit that and maybe tie it into grad school or Maybe, and this is the case too, maybe you are majoring in one thing, but you want to do something else in grad school, right? Something more specialized. Maybe um, you're majoring in, um, I don't know, electrical engineering and computer science is here, but you're really into robotics. And so when you do your PhD, you want to focus on robotics, right? So how does it relate to your overall interests and goals? The second question has absolutely nothing to do with research, but it does because they're asked something like, describe a major challenge you've encountered in your life, how you overcame it, what you learned as a result. I know for a fact in the UC prompts, a lot of students had a similar question that they talked about, right? So you can talk about that, right? Now, be very, you know, be very um, deliberate in your responses. For example, um, maybe I'll, I'll say, for example, uh, maybe you are taking classes remotely, right? Maybe you're taking classes remotely and your time zone is completely different, right? What have you done to change your um, study habits? How have you adjusted to be successful in your courses? That would be a good one. Another one might be, um, as a first generation college student, you know, has it been a challenge and, and what types of things did you encounter? Basically what they're looking for is they're looking for someone who's going to come into their program and finish the program. You don't want to admit somebody who's going to, you know, the second that they don't get any research results that they're going to say, oh, I, I have no research results, it's not working, or, you know, get discouraged. They're looking for students that have resilience, grit, and will stick with something, right? So resilience, grit, and stick with something. And they wanna make sure that you're going to stick with the program. So that's pretty much what they're asking. And again, if you go back to your scholarship essays, your UC application essays, I'm sure you have some things that you can talk about. Letters of recommendation. You're going to need letters of recommendation. So approach your faculty in person, and I have in person in quotes because in person now means via Zoom, of course, or um, you know scheduling meetings with them, um, but, but asking them. Ask them if they can give you a strong letter of recommendation. So 
in order for them to give you a strong letter of recommendation, you're going to need to give them the information. So you can give them drafts of your essays, you can give them your resume. Um, I, I don't know if I'd give them my transcript um, per se, but if they, you know, ask for, um, you know, maybe your resume and you have the grades, um, but basically as much as possible, right? Give them everything on a silver platter so they have that and give them as much time as possible. If you apply to an REU and it's due on Friday and you ask them Wednesday, they're probably not going to do it. But if you have an REU that's due on January 31st and you're approaching them in October, that gives them plenty of time. Not only does it give them plenty of time, it also gives you plenty of time uh, to prepare as much as possible, right? So letters of recommendation, make it easy. Let them know what program you're applying to and why. I had a student give me a beautiful, beautiful, uh, she, she literally like made it so easy. She said, here are the programs I'm applying to, the description, here's why I'm interested, here's the due dates, here's my resume, right? And so it was great. It was very, very easy. Oh, and fun fact, once somebody writes you one letter of recommendation, all they have to do is change stuff for the second one. So, so don't worry about that. Okay, so if you have uncertainties about these programs, ask before you apply. If there are any FAQs, check the FAQs, right? Um, be sure that you can actually participate in these programs. And this also goes for research in general, right? Maybe you decide, oh, I'm not really interested in the REU. I wanna do research on campus during the semester. But if you have a really heavy course load, make sure that you actually can devote the time to do it. Meet all the deadlines. Don't ask for any, um, any extensions. You know, if it's due on February 14th, then you need to get it in by February 14th. Don't, don't email them and say, well, you know, I have an exam that day. I'm kind of busy. No, you can't do that. Apply to more than one program. I think five is a good number. Verify your application has been received. And that could be a very short and sweet, you know, I've just applied to your program. I've asked my recommenders to submit their, you know, letters. Um, you know, if there's any additional information you need, Please let me know. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. Short and sweet. Don't, don't bother them and email them. You know, I mean, I had, I had a student one time email me like five times um, saying, you know, that, that they were busy and they were working on it and they were working on it and working on it. And I'm like, no, they're, they're not going to get in. And they didn't get in because they didn't turn in anything in. In fact, they didn't even finish the application. So, so don't be that student. Um, but I know you won't. Uh, question, who and how should we ask for letters recommendation if we haven't seen or interacted with professors? Very, very good question. Very good question. A similar question. I'm a freshman doing remote classes and all my classes are really large. So there's very little professor student interaction. Okay, these are excellent questions. So here's what I would do. So uh, we'll take the first, uh, the first question uh, first. So if you are, okay, so if you have not seen or interacted with your professors, so if you are a freshman doing remote classes, um, chances are freshmen, they typically, in these REE programs, they typically want two letters of recommendation. One should be from a professor, one might be from somebody like an advisor or um, a counselor, somebody like that, or maybe you've had a, an internship. You know, it could be from the second one. Sometimes can be uh, not from a professor. So you have that, right? So if you know someone, maybe your advisor, maybe somebody who knows you well, um, they can write a letter of recommendation. So that's number one. Number two, um, because these are remote classes you do have interaction with your GSIs, right? You do have interaction with your GSIs. So I think my question to you would be, are you establishing relationships with your professors and GSIs? Now, typically they don't want letters of recommendation from GSIs, 
but your GSI can give content that the professor can use. So if I were you, and if you're in a big class, you might say, look, I'm applying to this program. It's for first year students. I'm a student in your class. Here's why I'm interested, you know, but set up a time to talk to them. Set up, uh, set up a time to talk to them and make sure that you give them everything that they need to know. What is the program looking for and what you have uh, that really speaks to that. I know it's a little bit of tooting your own horn, but you have to, right? There's nothing wrong with that. So really, you know, when you ask for these letters of recommendation, just kind of give them everything. You know, here's the program I'm looking for. You know, here's why I want to apply. Here's what I've done in your class. Here's, you know, you kind of have to remind them a little bit and you make it easy for them. Okay, so how to make the most of an REU. So, you know, you wanna be responsive to all communication, even before the REU starts. Oftentimes they'll give you articles to write. Um, calibrate your expectations in advance. Don't go in, and this is true for not only an REU, but for, you know, research experience. Sometimes research is very, very slow. And so if you're like, I'm gonna get four papers, you're probably not gonna get four papers. You might even not even get one paper, but that doesn't matter because you are contributing to the research. Think about your living and social situation. So if you are, sometimes students say they want to commute. One time when I was running an REU um, at Berkeley, I had a student who, uh, she went to a different institution. She went to an institution in, um, in the Midwest, but she, her family lived here, right? And she was like, well, my family lives in Cupertino. Can I just commute? And I'm like, no, I think you should stay on campus. And she's like, no, I really want to commute. I'm like, no, nah, I don't think it's a good idea. She was so happy that she didn't commute. Can you imagine? So make sure that you um, are available, really, right? If she were to commute back and forth, it'd be a nightmare. So think about that. Bring your support structure with you. What that means is um, make sure that, you know, when you're doing these programs, whether it's, you know, on-campus research, on-campus research being, you know, in a lab, in, you know, remote, whatever, um, that you have a, a setting, right? So you have adequate technology. And if you don't, I know for the fact that um, for the remote internships this summer, uh, sometimes students actually got the equipment sent to them or, you know, if you have any needs. And, and on that topic, if anyone has any um, needs, whether it be hotspots, remotes, um, you know, please let us know in, in ESS because because we want to make sure that you have what you need to succeed. Um, sometimes students don't turn their cameras on because maybe it's broken. Um, if you have a computer and your you know camera's not working, uh, you know you can request a, a new updated one uh, so you will have one that's working because that's important. Um, Take advantage of every opportunity. So if you go to a different, you know, university, um, you might want to meet with other faculty and your research results will not define your success. So if you didn't get, you know, four papers published at the end of the summer, it doesn't mean it was a failure. Not at all. Summer research is a job. This is another student. These are two students. Um, this is a, they're both mechanical engineering students actually. Um, but research um, includes study, problem solving, and discovery. You'll also have the opportunity to be a part of a cohort, your lab cohort, but also your REU cohort. And so that's a really fun experience as well. Okay, so this is what not to do. Okay, so, so do not do any of these things. Do not. Don't just blow off the lab meetings, and this counts for REUs or, you know, or campus, right? Even if it's remote, even if it's in person, uh, don't skip on lab meetings. You might think that, oh, my professor doesn't even know I'm there. Believe me, they'll know if you're not there. Um, don't consider it a summer vacation. You know, um, don't, you know, just say, oh, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm going uh, out of town for two weeks. I'll be back in two weeks. You know, don't do that. Don't enroll in summer session courses. Very, very important. I know it doesn't seem like a big deal because when you first start research, it's, you know, it's kind of slow. 
But once it starts ramping up, you're really, really going to be glad that you didn't take research or you didn't take summer courses because it's gonna take time away from your research. This is an important one. Don't misrepresent UC Berkeley. If you, um, those, some of those um, experiences that I talked about, the UAV project, for example, uh, the student that did that, he had a great experience, right? He had a wonderful experience. I'm sure that faculty wants more. I had another student uh, two years ago who did a um, RU uh, in, uh, what was it, at RIT. Great experience, right? Great experience, right? So we want to build a pipeline for Berkeley students to get these opportunities. And unfortunately, if somebody goes and maybe they're kind of flaky or they're just not into it or they just, you know, blow it off, then the challenge is it's very likely that if somebody else applies from that institution, maybe that same major, that they might say, oh, I had the student from, you know, nuclear engineer and oh, they were terrible, right? I know it sounds awful, but don't misrepresent Berkeley. And I would say that's true not only for um, REU programs, but also for jobs as well, right? So you're, you wanna be an ambassador. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you leave such a great impression and you get such a good letter of recommendation that they're like, hey, um, I don't know who's on here, let's see. Uh, Migdalia, hey, Migdalia. Do you have any friends that are also interested in this program? We'd love to send some great students like you, right? So you want to be an ambassador for the program. That's important. Uh, some of you that are in bioengineering, you might, uh, you might recognize uh, Professor Aaron Streets, uh, Carolina Rios, and her graduate mentors, right? So those are actual, these are actual students. These are not models, although they all could be models, but these are actual students. And so you want to make sure that you have a great research experience and you have a strong letter of recommendation after that experience, right? So it's basically an interview, right? It's a nine to 10 week interview. Um, your graduate students are your daily supervisors. A lot of time their uh, feedback will inform the letters of recommendation that are written by the professors. Adjust to the lab protocol, that's very important. You know, if the lab meetings start at, you know, 11 a.m., then you're there at 10.59, right? No Berkeley time. So, you know, whatever the lab protocol is, um, prepare for the research meetings and meet with your faculty mentor. Those are very important. And that is true for whether it's, you know, REU in the summer, whether it's, um, you know, remote during the semester, whether it's in person during the semester, like this is a job. And so take it seriously. Um, all of you, um, I would love to keep in touch. You know, um, if we were on a, uh, you know, if we were on campus, I would say, hey, come to my office, 227 Bechtel. Uh, but right now we're not. So uh, my virtual office, um, I'm on LinkedIn. So if you have a LinkedIn, uh, you know, I'd love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, I have a, a fun Instagram page, or if you want to follow um, REU Finder, sometimes I'll, I'll put tips on there. Um, I did kind of a funny resume one because with like a Halloween theme. Um, but just like tips, tips on resumes, tips on talking to professors, tips on applying, um, maybe, you know, things that people have questions about, but they're like, oh, I don't want to ask that, you know, um, anything that you want to know. And um, opportunities. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, posting opportunities all the time on there. So, you know, check it out and, and it'll save you a lot of, of clicks, right? Because you'll know, okay, I'm eligible for this. I'm going to apply or, oh, that's not, maybe next year I'll apply. Um, that's it for the slides. I did a lot of talking. Um, I would love to hear from all of you. So does anyone have any questions? any questions at all this is when i miss uh the meeting but we weren't sure how many students were going to come on here so any questions that anyone has you can feel free to put it in the chat or you can um 
you can put it in the Q&A. If you put it in the chat, I'll just, uh, I'll just read it out. Um, will the presentation be recorded and sent out? Yes, it will be. Um, are you posting the slideshow online? Yes, absolutely. Well, we're going to uh, do the whole uh, video, so yes. Other questions? Well, I have questions for you. Uh, maybe in the chat. Oh, let's see. We have a question. Um, question. Oh, thank you so much. It was informative. Oh, do you have any tips on um, cold emailing professors? Um, at a grad school panel last week, they suggested that was a way of getting research. Yes. So um, for cold, uh, you know, kind of cold emailing, don't put you know, dear professor, right? Because that's a tell. Um, put their name, right? Dear professor, whatever their name is. Be specific. Be very, very specific. So if you're emailing, I don't know, Alice Agagino, right? You're emailing Alice Agagino. Um, maybe, you know, if you're emailing her, tell her specifically what research you're interested in, what project you're interested in, how you found out about the research, right? Whether it was through a friend, whether it was through um, just like, you know, cold emailing anyone, right? Usually it's, you know, you introduce yourself. So you introduce yourself, how you found out about the position, what you um, are asking for, short and sweet, right? Short and sweet, but don't do a form email, you know, dear, you know, sir or madam or to whom it may concern or whatever, like, they're just going to throw those away, right? So be specific, like specific in your research, and they're going to be able to tell. Other questions? Any question at all? I'm interested in, um, in seeing what majors. So if you want to put in the chat like what your majors are um, and or what majors you're in and maybe what areas of research you're interested in or what you're interested in. Uh, I don't think anyone has any questions. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to put your name. You could just say, you know, if you have any questions. I know we covered a lot, but I just want to make sure that um, if anyone, you know, has any questions that we, we answer them. Um, oh, IOR major, global poverty and practice major, and design innovation interest. Okay, fun fact. Um, I got an email yesterday from a program at um, North Texas University, and they are looking for interns for next summer. Um, and I believe it's through their industrial engineering department. Um, X major comp biology interest. Okay, that's good. Yeah, definitely um, nurse might be a good one, although um, that might be, you know, certainly um, something uh, anything related to computational biology, there's there's tons of them. So if you decide to do the pathways to science, I would look under EECS um, and Comp Bio. But that's good. Um, very good. So civil engineering, research related transportation systems, data collection, and transportation. I would look at. Um, oh gosh. Um, Alexander Bayan, maybe he might be good because he runs a transportation center on campus. Um, ooh, civil engineering interested in water-based hydraulics. I would look at UIUC, uh, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, although certainly the in, uh, civil engineering department at Berkeley, um, Evan Variano is, a, is an amazing uh, research mentor. And he's also um, just a great you know, person to talk to if you're interested in getting involved in research. He can probably point you in the right direction. Uh, civil engineers. If you're in civil engineering and you don't know uh, Dr. V, you should. He's, he's great. He's a great resource. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's tons, tons of opportunities. Um, and if you, um, I'll put my um, contact info up again. If you want to email me, 
feel free to email me if you want to set up a time to to talk and you know um and show me your resume if you're like oh my resume is rough uh you know happy to look at your resume um some some students when we were on campus they would come in and they would hand me their resume and they'd say here don't be kind and i would take the pen and i'd say okay I change this move that blah 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 um i do that in google docs now so happy to do that um or if you you know have a cold email that you want to send a professor and you're like oh i don't know how this sounds uh you know send me an email and i'll i'll give you some feedback um but the main thing is is that um you know like do not let this remote experience um you know don't don't see that as an obstacle there's there, the research is, is still happening it's still happening it's still getting done and this is a temporary situation and so um you know we want to make sure that you're prepared now so that you know when these opportunities in person come up that you'll be able to take advantage of them and you'll be prepared and um you're gonna think oh my gosh i'm so glad i i did this you know it changed my life because uh, these can be life-changing experiences. On the flip side, you might think, oh, I don't want to do research. Like, this isn't for me, right? So then you know, right? So it's a learning experience. Awesome. So it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you. I think Luis, um, Luis, thank you so much for moderating. And we will, um, there you are. Um, Luis, where is that supposed to be on campus? Uh, I think it's near uh, the entrance of campus. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. um, it's from the south side, not the north side where we are. Oh, what? There's a south side of campus? <laughs> um, oh, somebody asked for, uh, can I have your email? I want to show you my resume. Um, yes. I'll, I'll put that up on the screen again. So here's my email. Um, yeah, so here's my email, uh, treardon at berkeley.edu. And I would love to chat with you. And yeah, we can set up a time to, to chat and, um, you know, kind of help you explore your research interests. And um, like I said, I've, I've had a lot of students um that are you know in grad school i have students that are applying now to grad school i have students that are in grad school i have students that are professors um i'm a lot older than i look um and so you know i i think that you know really um whatever it is you want to do that you know there's there's opportunities out there and so uh my job is just to kind of help you and support you and and get you connected um, and connect with each other too. I, I think that's an important thing. Connect with each other um, because you know maybe you know Avery, you know, is interested in in IELR, but then you know uh, Jasmine is interested in civil engineering, and it's like, oh well, I'm not interested in this, but I know Garrett and Jasmine want to do this, so I'll connect them. Right. So I think that's important as well. Um, networking. Networking is very very powerful. So, awesome. Very cool. Do you want to put a quick plug for the CAEE? Yeah, definitely. If any of you all are interested in seeking out any support for tutoring or are struggling with any of the courses, keeping up with the material, make sure to visit the Center for Access to Engineering Excellence and you can find our site under Academic Support and the Berkeley Engineering page. Awesome. So we will share the webinar um we'll post it and you can watch it tell your friends and um yeah I, I look forward to seeing you and then um we'll also send information on the poster session um where you can see some of the research being done as well so i think that's that's also a nice a nice thing to to see all right thank you so much stephanie for the presentation and for helping out all these students asking questions about how to get involved with research Thank you. All right, well, take care.